in a quiet Czech town, an act of kindness takes a sinister turn, shattering the tranquil atmosphere and plunging the community into an abyss of unimaginable tragedy. Join us as we delve into the chilling tale of a young American visitor whose arrival sets in motion a series of harrowing events. Prepare to be drawn into the captivating darkness of this case, where the boundaries between sanity and madness blur and the once serene facade of a tight-knit community crumbles in the very face of unspeakable tragedy. It's a story that will keep you on the edge of your seat as we peel back the layers and reveal the disturbing secrets that lie beneath. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Chasing Shadows channel. This is where we look at serial killers, murder cases and other mysteries. This one is truly disturbing, so relax, get comfortable and as always, viewer discretion is very much advised. Ivanchisa is a suburb of Brno in the Czech Republic and has a rich history dating back to the 13th century. It was originally a settlement centered around a castle which later became a significant feudal estate. Over the centuries, Ivanchisa developed into a town with a strong agricultural and industrial base. Its population in 2021 was only 6,500. Ivanchisa is known for its beautiful landmarks and historical sites it has a vibrant cultural scene. It hosts various events and festivals throughout the year. The town has a museum that showcases local history and traditions, and traditional folklore and customs are still celebrated. Ivanchisa is located in the picturesque countryside of South Moravia, which is known for its vineyards and wine production. The region offers opportunities for outdoor activities such as hiking and cycling. Additionally, its proximity to Brno allows residents and visitors to access the amenities and attractions of a larger city. It is in this picturesque town that this terrible crime unfolded. Let me introduce you to Kevin Dahlgren, a 20-year-old American from sunny Sacramento in California. His parents thought it would be a good idea for him to pay a visit to his cousin Veronica and her family in Brno. They were hoping this change might help him with some mental health issues he was struggling with and spend some quality time with relatives. The connection between the family is interesting. The cousins have the same grandparents who fled Czechoslovakia during the communist coup back in 1948. They took one daughter with them and fled to America. They left the other daughter behind and were hoping to have her join them shortly. Unfortunately, all attempts to get her out failed and the family only reconnected again after communism fell in 1989. After this, they visited each other often. Veronika Harakova, a 46-year-old teacher, and her 55-year-old entrepreneur husband Martin Horak, along with her sons Philip, 25 years old, and 16-year-old David, opened their doors to Kevin. The Harrock family, as they were known, were big music enthusiasts and active members of the Brno music scene. In fact, they even formed a ukulele band called Ukulele Orchestra Jako Brno, spreading musical joy wherever they went. Kevin seemed to be settling down well with friends, neighbors, and family friends. He made friends with Kyle Christofferson, a fellow American who was fluent in Czech. Kyle helped Kevin navigate his way around. Kyle arranged an interview at the university for Kevin. Friends of the family say Kevin was friendly and cheerful and seemed stable and balanced. But here's where it gets dark. As the days passed, Kevin's behavior started raising some eyebrows. Veronica was getting fed up with how he treated the family and rumors started circulating about Kevin wandering around the house with a knife. Tension was building and he became weirdly fixated on David and Philippe, always following them around and invading their privacy. So although tension in the home was building, it was hardly enough to warrant killing the whole family. On the day of the murders, the morning of May the 23rd, 2013, Veronica decided to stay home because she wasn't feeling well. She called a school where she worked to let them know. The exact sequence of events remains a bit fuzzy but we can piece together some details thanks to witness accounts and security cameras. Veronica's watch stopped at 8 a.m., so the police would later surmise that that was the approximate time that she died. Around 9 a.m., a postman showed up at the door and Kevin, looking totally on edge, answered the door and signed for the mail delivery. Fast forward to 11 a.m. when the family cleaner arrived, but Kevin did not allow her into the house, claiming they didn't need her that day. David, who had been at school, arrived home at around 12.30 p.m. and is presumably killed immediately. Kevin then fled the house and took a taxi to Vienna, arriving at around 5 p.m. He booked a flight back to America. 
It's only about 111 kilometers or 68 miles from the airport, so he must have been in the house with the bodies for most of the day. Back at the victim's home, neighbors were just realizing that something was wrong. One of the neighbors had noticed the house had been unusually quiet on the day. Normally there was singing and music playing on the Horax Terrace. A few noticed faint smoke. At around 10 p.m. they realized it was coming from Veronica's house, so they decided to check that the family was okay. Entering through the garage, they extinguished the flames of what looked like a small fire. Then they noticed three charred bodies. The police and fire department were notified and they found Veronica's body upstairs on the bed in her bedroom. All the victims had been stabbed and slashed with an ax and knife numerous times, with one of the victims stabbed a staggering 29 times. David was also hit with a rock or stone, probably to incapacitate him before being stabbed. Kevin was considered the prime suspect by Czech police, and the next day Czech authorities, realizing that Kevin had fled the country, issued an international arrest warrant. He was charged in absentia with committing the quadruple murders. Subsequently, at approximately 1 p.m., the Austrian authorities alerted the crew of Austrian Airlines Flight OS-93 about the arrest warrant. The flight carrying Kevin had departed Vienna at 10.46 a.m. and was flying over the United Kingdom at the time. It was decided not to alert him, citing fears that he might have learned about his wanted status while on board the aeroplane and reacted by endangering the other passengers. He was arrested at Washington Dulles Airport once the plane landed. The American judge at the extradition hearing repeated several times that this is not a typical guilt or innocence trial, but only an extradition proceeding. Thus, the Czech Republic must prove the suspicion of murder and not a set of bulletproof evidence. Prosecutor Patricia Haynes said the evidence far exceeds the standards needed to support extradition. Five people are in the home, four get killed, one flees. That alone we submit as the probable cause to support the extradition, Haynes said. It was three years after the crime before it was finalized, and he would be the first American to be extradited to the Czech Republic. As the investigation was being carried out, the community held a funeral at the St. Lawrence Church in Brno in the Czech Republic on June the 1st, 2013. The atmosphere was filled with both sorrow and music as relatives, friends and hundreds of mourners gathered at the packed church of St. Lawrence in the Rekovice district of Brno. Unfortunately, many others couldn't enter the church due to the overwhelming turnout, so speakers were set up outside to broadcast the funeral ceremony. The funeral service was uniquely tailored to honor the family's memory, incorporating their favorite songs. The significance of these musical choices was emphasized by the eulogist, who aptly conveyed that words alone could not capture the essence of who they were. The melodies of iconic artists such as Bob Dylan, John Lennon and Ray Charles resounded throughout the church before the mass commenced. The mourners were deeply moved by a recording of the song Desert Rose performed by the ukulele orchestra, a band that two of the slain family members belonged to. The band expressing their profound grief shared on their bandzone.cz profile that the pain extended not only to them, but also to anyone fortunate enough to have known the family personally. It was particularly poignant that the recently recorded song featured one of the deceased men as a vocalist and the other as a soloist. The tragic incident sent shockwaves throughout the entire community. Can you imagine the horror and disbelief that must have swept through everyone when they learned about it? It's one of those things that just left me speechless. And what makes it even more unsettling is the connection between the families involved. The Harrock family was a beloved part of their neighborhood and Kevin's arrival in the Czech Republic was initially seen as a chance for support and family bonding. Who would have thought that it would end in such a horrifying way? Now let's talk about the trial and the details that emerged. At trial, the judge read some of the things that Kevin had previously said about his life, like his various jobs in the USA, working in a textile consignment shop, dealing with animals for vets, and even working for a moving company. He had some martial arts training and was good with computers. Sounded like a pretty ordinary guy, right? But as the trial went on, it became clear that there was a lot more going on beneath the surface. According to the indictment, Kevin's decision to kill his relatives was a result of his personality traits, emotional instability, narcissism, and increased aggression. He just couldn't live up to the expectations of those around him. One chilling detail that came out during the trial was when Kevin told the police that the voices in my head wanted me to destroy everything, all the time. The judge rightly described the crime as extraordinarily serious, emphasizing how Kevin tried to solve his problems by wiping out the entire family. 
It's just mind-boggling. Now, let's take a look at the evidence presented by the prosecution. They had some pretty strong stuff against Kevin. Forensic evidence played a big role in linking him to the crime scene. Bloodstains on his shorts matched the victim's blood, and his DNA was found on the murder weapons. And to add to that, Kevin's flight from the Czech Republic after the murders was seen as a sign of guilt. Kevin initially denied any responsibility for the murders, but later confessed while in custody in the US. However, he retracted his confession and claimed he was coerced into making it. The defence argued that Kevin's mental state at the time of the murders should be taken into account. They claimed he was suffering from a mental illness and wasn't responsible for his actions. But the prosecution wasn't buying it. They argued that there was no solid evidence to support the claim and that Kevin knew exactly what he was doing. A psychiatrist's testimony followed. Dahlgren suffered from a mixed personality disorder, but not to such an extent he could be declared mentally ill during the murders. He seemed to have identity problems. Dahlgren had spoken about his internal voice that told him what to do in order to become a hero. This, however, did not reach a state of psychosis, according to the psychiatrist. A person in the state of psychosis would not be able to commit the murders in the manner they were carried out over several hours, with bodies being dragged to the garage, covered up, and then an attempt made to burn the house. The defence attorney criticised the psychiatrist, claiming that American specialists found that he was suffering from bipolar-type schizoaffective disorder. The psychiatrist rejected that analysis, saying that she had spent more time with Dahlgren, collected much more data, and that Dahlgren had shown no symptoms of such a disorder during his long-term pre-trial custody. In the end, the witnesses who testified during the trial played a crucial role in securing a conviction against Kevin. Their accounts provided important context for understanding the behaviour and mindset leading up to the crime. And let's not forget the forensic evidence presented in court, which tied everything together. Dahlgren was sentenced to life in prison on July the 20th, 2016, but appealed the verdict. In December 2016, the court asked for another medical opinion on Dahlgren's sanity. And in March 2017, the original ruling was upheld. Richard Spiszek, defense attorney for Dahlgren, revealed that his client had exhibited suicidal tendencies. Despite efforts by Valdisa prison to prevent such incidents, Spisak acknowledged the difficulty in preventing all suicides, especially if the convicted individual is determined. In the past, Dahlgren's mental state had led to his temporary placement in a psychiatric ward at Buonice prison in Brno. In September, Dahlgren appealed to the Supreme Court, requesting either protective custody or a lighter sentence, considering his mental condition. While the appeal did not challenge the guilty verdict, it highlighted Dahlgren's struggles. Previously, Dahlgren had attempted self-harm and aggression towards guards, resulting in his placement in a psychiatric ward. Dahlgren claimed that he did not intend to take his own life, but rather sought an outlet for his anger. Dahlgren committed suicide in Valdigsa prison by hanging himself on the 11th of January 2018. This is a chilling case that makes you question the depths of human darkness. Kevin Dahlgren's terrible actions left a trail of destruction and the impact on Veronica's family and the community is simply unimaginable. Personally, I can't help but feel a mix of anger, sadness and disbelief. How could someone who was initially seen as friendly and stable turn into a cold-blooded killer? The signs of tension were building, but no one could have predicted the outcome. Perhaps he was asked to move out because of his behaviour, or to get a job. As Kevin remained silent on this matter, we will never know the actual motive. There is no information on the history of his mental health, but it is clear that he did have mental health issues. What exactly they were is not known. The swift action of the Czech police and the subsequent arrest of Kevin back in the US brought a sense of justice to the victim's loved ones. It's a reminder that no matter where you run, justice has a way of catching up with you. But beyond the details of the trial and the evidence presented, this case serves as a chilling reminder of the unpredictability of human nature. It's a stark reminder to pay attention to those around us, to trust our instincts when something doesn't feel right, and to never underestimate the potential for darkness lurking in even the most seemingly ordinary individuals. This situation once again highlights the link between mental health and violence. I believe it is crucial to emphasize and educate the public, doctors and families about the importance of taking mental health more seriously, particularly when a person exhibits signs of violence. For example, in this case, the individual is walking around with a knife and engaging in excessive drinking. 2023 is the 10th anniversary of the murders, so I'd like to take a moment to remember Veronica, Martin, Philip and David, 
the innocent lives tragically taken away in an act of terrifying violence. May their souls be at peace and may their stories serve as a reminder of the importance of cherishing our loved ones and staying vigilant in a world that sometimes hides horrors beneath its surface. What are your thoughts on this case? I would love to hear your opinions and if you have any cases you want us to look at, please put it in the comments below. Join me next time on Chasing Shadows as we dive into more mysteries seeking answers and hoping to shed light on the darkest corners of the human psyche. If you enjoyed this case, please like and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Until then, stay safe and hold your loved ones a little closer.